your recent comments by John Mozalock mean that Cardinals fans should brace themselves for the team to have a reduction in payroll coming soon. What's going on, everyone, and welcome in to this edition of b Shave Daily. It is Tuesday, September 3rd, 2024. Hope everybody had a safe and happy holiday weekend for Labor Day. Uh, my family was up at the family farm, so it's been a few days since we have jumped on the channel here. And as we return, plenty of topics to get into as the Cardinals end up winning the weekend series there in New York. They got the better of the Yankees after dropping the first game of that series, but how about that offensive explosion on Sunday, the 14-7 win? Uh, things were looking pretty good Saturday, too. Almost coughed it up with the bullpen there, but they were able to hold on with a very thrilling ninth inning and a save by Ryan Helsley. But then, of course, Labor Day on Monday afternoon, you get that new series fired up against the Brewers, and the Cardinals did not show very Strong in that one, 9-3 to three, losing to Milwaukee in game one of that series. So you're still kind of spinning your wheels in the standings if you're the Cardinals. And I think a lot of people have long since sort of given up on this season being one that can reach the playoffs. But over this tough stretch of schedule, the Cardinals really have held their own. It's just kind of takes you back to what we said at the very beginning of this stretch, that playing around 500 baseball is not going to be enough over this 19 games against playoff contenders. And they've held their own. They've treaded water. But you look at the standing situation that they were in at the beginning of this stretch. It necessitated them going on a bit more of a run during this stretch here. And uh, we haven't really seen that. Now, the Cardinals can win the next couple of games in Milwaukee. And that would then allow them to finish up this stretch a couple games above 500. And they would still be in position to make a charge against a part of their schedule that maybe lightens up a bit down the, the stretch of the season. But it's still looking a little bit bleak as the Cardinals stand here as of this recording on Tuesday morning, five and a half games out of the wild card. But we want to talk a little bit more about some big picture topics as John Mozeliak made some interesting comments to Tom Ackerman on KMOX's Sports on a Sunday Morning show a couple of days ago. They're now making the rounds on social media that I feel like we should weigh in on, and it's a topic that we've been spending some time on in recent months and, and, and even in recent weeks as we viewed the way the Cardinals handled the trade deadline and talked about the fact that they didn't want to necessarily according to various reports, add payroll at the time. And now we've seen the Cardinals, obviously, DFA, guys like Sean Armstrong and Tommy Pham, who are those veterans on one-year contracts that they brought in to try and boost the team. And those guys end up in other places. Uh, Interestingly enough, the Royals and Cubs is where Tommy Pham and Sean Armstrong go. Like even the Cubs are going, yeah, we'll we'll spend the money on that guy down the stretch because he might be a good, you know, middle relief option for our bullpen. Cardinals said, ah, maybe we should maybe we should move on and, and maybe save a few dollars, uh, give a guy like Riley O'Brien a look, which, look, I get it. He had an exciting arm in spring, and, and you did want to see as far as uh, maybe planning for next year's team what Riley O'Brien could be if he could fit into that. And after yesterday, I think people are down on that. His ERA is almost 20, and the limited opportunity he's had with the Cardinals uh, did, did not fare particularly well in Monday's loss. So that's kind of looking like a, a move that's coming back to bite you a little bit. And the motivations of the Cardinals were sort of in play at that, right? Like, what are they looking to accomplish right now? Is it try to make a run or is it more get a look at guys for 2025? Certainly feels like the latter. There are some areas where you could be doing both at the same time. Like, I think adding Luke and Baker to this team has been something that helps the Cardinals, right? Helps them potentially find out more about him. But also, you know, he's performing in a solid role for them right now, and that might help you win more games down the stretch too. So you can sometimes accomplish two things at once. Um, by the way, with the Tommy Pham thing, like I don't know how, and I think Katie Wu's story kind of summed it up pretty well. I don't think Tommy Pham wanted to stay. I think Tommy Pham asked to be to be waived and get on a team that was uh, maybe pointed in more of the direction of trying to win now. And I, I think Katie's story essentially said the Cardinals were kind of doing right by the player who, again, I think Tommy Pham was sort of in the mode of, if if y'all aren't trying to win now, like it seemed a month ago when you traded for me that you were, um, get me out of here, I think is probably the way that that played out. So uh, he goes to the Royals, and by the way, the Royals needed Tommy Pham. I mean, uh, they lose Vinny Pasquantino from their lineup. I thought they could use a guy like Tommy Pham months ago before the Cardinals even traded for him. But anyway, like those are some of the things that are going on, and you're just wondering a little bit about the motivations, but Mosellock's comments on KMOX sort of are geared toward that end and something that I think we do need to talk about. But before we get into all that, I want to say that I thoroughly appreciate all of your support on this channel throughout the year and want to take a moment to tell you about Underdog Fantasy, the easiest place to play fantasy sports, and it's also the fastest-growing fantasy app 
in the industry. You can sign up now for Underdog Fantasy with my promo code BSHAFF. That's B-S-C-H-A-E-F-F. It's right there on your screen. To claim your free pick and first-time deposit offer up to $1,000 in bonus cash. My favorite thing about Underdog Fantasy is their Pick'em game, which you can play in the state of Missouri. Pick whether your favorite players will have a higher or lower stat total in their game for a chance to win big. You pick between two and eight players to build a Pick'em injury, and you can pick them from different sports as well. Underdog Fantasy has baseball, obviously NFL coming up, tennis, golf. They've got a little bit of everything on Underdog Fantasy, and it is a great way to play fantasy sports i'm excited to take a look at some of those nfl player stats for the upcoming nfl week one and pick higher or lower on their stat totals put a few players into a pick em entry and you can have yourself some fun go to underdogfantasy.com or find them in the app store and don't forget to register with my promo code be shaved claim your free pick and first time deposit offer up to a thousand in bonus cash appreciate you guys and your support of the channel now that underdog is a partner on the show Let's go ahead and get into some of these thoughts from John Mozeliak because, as I mentioned, he did speak with Tom Ackerman on KMOX's Sports on a Sunday Morning show. Uh, A lot of interesting things to be gleaned from this, perhaps. They spent some time talking about this year's team and some of the things that have gone wrong and and things like the Contreras injury and the guys at the corners, Goldie and Arado, maybe not performing up to expectations for the full season. Uh, But then they got into a little bit more on the, the attendance stuff, which has been a obviously a, a topic of conversation for people in recent weeks. And it was kind of interesting to get Mosellock's thoughts on it. And so I'll just kind of play it and then we can react a little bit to some of these comments. Uh, once again, this is Mo on there with uh, Tom Ackerman of KMOX this past Sunday morning. Mo, I asked Ollie this question and about the crowd and, and the sparse crowd against the Padres, those four games. And is it talked about in the clubhouse? And he said, it is, but not as much as you would think. Um, I I'd, I'd like to ask you that how do you what, what, how do you see that what is what, when you see a crowd that light uh, what is your response to that oh, I mean it's frustrating uh, I, I mean obviously uh, our fan base is not happy with uh, our current product and uh, they're, they're displaying that I suppose by not showing up um, you know especially look at that vibe you saw in, in New York which is just you know it's incredible it's dynamic and you know, that's something that we've become accustomed to here in St. Louis. And obviously our performance, our record is probably indicative of, you know, why we're starting to see uh, a smaller crowd, but, you know, that's something that, you know, from a business standpoint and, and a strategy standpoint, we're going to have to try to understand what the future looks like from that standpoint. Obviously, no, we know we're going to have uh, um, an uphill climb with, what the TV market is going to look like moving forward. And, and so, uh, you know, we're going to have our challenges. And, and so, you know, I think our side is going to have to recalibrate a little bit and, you know, I'm still hopeful though our fan base will, will support us and, and appreciate what we're trying to do. But, you know, I can understand that level of frustration too. So that's John Mozeliak on the lack of attendance that we're kind of seeing at Bush stadium recently. And everybody seems to have been weighing in on this topic. We talked about it from, Greg Amzinger in a recent video, the comments that he made on 101 ESPN in St. Louis, and now you're hearing from John Mozeliak on the same topic, but the notion of, yeah, we understand their frustration, but it's also going to mean that we might have to recalibrate some things because, remember, that whole TV contract is a thing that we're still kind of dealing with, and so Mo says, obviously, we know we're going to have an uphill climb with what the TV markets could look like moving forward, and so we're going to have our challenges basically kind of connecting the notion of fans are upset with the product and that, you know, Mosellac is, is not blind to that. And he said, our performance in our record is indicative of why we're seeing a smaller crowd, but then shifting into from a business standpoint, that's going to mean some things. And if we can't count on the 3 million through the gate that we've always been able to basically roll out of bed and know is going to be there every season, and, and what that means for our revenues. And if we combine that with, well, TV, we don't even, nobody knows what's going to happen there. It's a rapidly changing situation. We're going to have to recalibrate. And that's, look, it, it's not something anybody wants to hear if you're a Cardinals fan, but I don't, I don't think they're bluffing you guys. Like, I think this is indicative of, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be a shift here and it, maybe it's a subtle one. Maybe it's a big one. I think the extent of the shift is really all we're waiting to to see play out. But this organization has been, you know, as much as we kind of say, oh, they don't spend enough. 
And you, if you look at payrolls, the Cardinals, it's not that they've been cheap. Like, I push back against that. But I think they have not spent particularly effectively with the big money they've often doled out. And, and I'm even counting, when you say big money, like there are teams who, to sign two $11 million free agent pitchers in the offseason like they did with Lynn and Gibson, and then sign a Sonny Gray to a, a three-year contract of a, of a significantly higher value, like that's spending a good chunk of money. I, I know they backloaded the Sonny stuff a little bit to where they weren't paying him as much up front in 2024, but that, I mean, they spent in the offseason. But when you're, when you're a Cardinals fan, you're like, look, right now a lot of Cardinals fans are looking at Stephen Matz coming back to pitch, and they're looking at Lance Lynn. You know, he gave up five runs and in three innings in a minor league rehab start. And it's like, are you going to put that guy back in the rotation over maybe trying out some of the the younger guys and the guys that, hey, maybe you could learn that this, this guy could be a part of your rotation next year. And instead of spending money on kind of replacement level starting pitching, you might be able to find that there are more effective ways to spend that money. And now it could be a case where the Cardinals are like, yeah, we, we can't spend that kind of money at all. And almost could be forced into finding out more about some of their younger players, which is going to be interesting to see what they do over the coming weeks. Like, look, man, and again, Andre Pallante just struggled, and it's kind of interesting to see the, the narrative shift on him. He's been their best starting pitcher since the end of May, since he joined the rotation, like statistically. And he has one bad game where he walks a bunch of guys and, and you know, gives up a, a couple of ill-timed home runs. You can't walk two guys and then give up a homer. You're not going to have a very successful day. That was Andre Pallante's story on Monday afternoon. It's just the way it played out in the 9-3 to loss. But I mean, if we're going to look at that and go, well, Palante obviously can't be in the rotation the rest of the season. Got to get Lance Lynn back in there. I'm I'm going to be questioning what anybody on this Cardinals team is looking at. Like, Lance Lynn might roll out of bed on, you know, five days from now and and throw five innings of one-run baseball. It very well could happen. But if you're already into a mode of, of shifting toward looking at next year, I don't really know how a Lance Lynn over Andre Palante decision would make any sense to anybody. Um, I don't know what they're going to do. They're, they're obviously they're putting mats back in and they're kind of shifting back some of the other guys and and it's not really a six man rotation but modified as such for a little while to see what happens I think it's going to be the play and we'll just see what ends up happening with the performance of some of these guys but I, if you're talking about reductions in payroll and and look they didn't Mosaic in these comments wasn't that specific with saying hey it's going to be a reduction in payroll but he said we're gonna to have to recalibrate we got to be aware of the attendance issues we got to be aware of the TV issues. There are going to be some challenges, he said. Our side, that means his baseball ops department, we're going to have to recalibrate a little bit. And then says, I'm still hopeful our fan base will support us and appreciate what we're trying to do. But I can understand their frustration too. He's basically saying, I understand why people are frustrated, but if we don't get the support, it it's not going to get any better in terms of the money we can spend. But I think there is an argument to be made that, and look, I think payroll will reduce in 2025. But I think it's going to come from those areas that you could make a case the Cardinals team next year might not be any worse if you say, hey, we're going to have to kind of be forced to do things we haven't been willing to do before. We used to, in in the days of we knew the, the support from the fans was coming, we knew the TV contract was rock solid, we would spend to make sure we didn't have the bottom drop out. That's why they added Lynn. That's why they added Gibson. That was Sonny Gray. Make sure the rotation doesn't bottom out like it somehow did in 2023. There were a lot of things that happened that year, and it bottomed out on us. We can't have that again. So we're going to spend just to make sure it doesn't happen again, but what you cost yourself there is upside. What if a Graceffo or a McGreevy or somebody from your minor league group that clearly they didn't have a lot of trust in for them to go out and spend, you know, 10, 11, 12 million per starter for a number four, number five back-end arms and to lock up Michaelis when they did, and he's kind of the same sort of vibe, a back end of the rotation producer right now. To do all those things, it says they really didn't have much trust in those guys, and they want the guys being McGreevy, Graceffo, that that crop of AAA pitchers. You can count Libertor and Zach Thompson in that grouping as well. Guys that coming into the year, we were looking at saying, all right, I guess that's your depth. That's like your sixth starter competition, but, you know, what's that going to what's that going to turn into? Instead, we could have a 2025 Cardinals team where basically half of those group are staffing your starting rotation to begin the season because they don't pay to make sure the bottom doesn't drop out of the rotation. And maybe one year further along, that actually might be a decent strategy because, A, you can find out if McGreevy is going to sink or swim. You can find out if Graceffo is going to sink or swim, et cetera. 
all the while, guys like Quinn Matthews and maybe even Tink Hentz are another year along to be able to join consideration for maybe a midseason 2025 spot in the rotation. So maybe the organization will be better set up for this type of thing. But what do you guys take from the general messaging that, look, they're not coming out and saying reduction in payroll, but if you're reading between the lines on some of this and you couple it with those comments we talked about from Bill DeWitt the third a number of months back where he said, I sort of laugh at the notion of fans saying they're going to boycott the games because all we do is take the revenues and turn it back into payroll. And so if they don't come to games, you know, we're going to have to reduce. That's sort of just been the underlying tension when it comes to Cardinals fans and this organization for a number of months now. And we've talked a lot about the TV contract where we really don't know very much about what's coming there. It's uncertain. And with that uncertainty, and now you can add uncertainty to revenues in terms of the gate and the, the, the folks coming to the stadium, the Cardinals, I, I do think they are going to approach this offseason differently. Does that, is that something Cardinals fans want to hear? No. Do they want to hear that Bill DeWitt's not firing John Mosellock, that he's going to finish out his contract? No, but I'm just trying to give you, I, brace yourselves. Like that's, that's the kind of genesis of this video here is brace yourselves for the reaction from team brass and that's ownership. That's the front office. Brace yourself for that reaction to a potentially another missed playoffs to be more. We have to recalibrate because the fans aren't really standing behind what we're doing and coupled with a TV contract that we don't control the outcome of, we might have to be a little more careful with how we're spending if you were thinking the reaction was going to be heads are going to roll and they're going to just go balls to the wall to try to make sure they make the playoffs in 2025, beware, like brace yourselves. It's not going to go that way. That's not going to be the turn this organization is set to take. Um, you, the, the fire and the fury is out there from the Cardinals fans. I don't, I'm not saying you're wrong either. I, I'm on your side, but I'm just telling you what's going to happen, not what should happen. Um, you know, there is a world in which, what should happen and what's going to happen can have some crossover and some overlap. What's going to happen is payroll is going to be a little tighter than you're used to seeing. They're going to have to be a little bit smarter with the money they do spend. And with the way that this front office has spent, a lot of the free agent contracts have not panned out over the, the course of time. I'm not ripping them for certain deals. Like I think Contreras, we're going to say, hey, good signing, understood why they did it. Bumpy at the start, but that wasn't really their fault. Well, a little bit expectations needed to be managed a little better than they were for what Wilson's role was going to be. It certainly wasn't Contreras' fault. And now you're too. He's, he's hit the ball, but he's gotten two injuries, flukish in both cases, that have, have truncated his season. Not a lot you can do about that. But some of these other deals where you're going, all right, $2 million bucks for a Brandon Crawford. What upside did that ever have? And for a team that's talking about tightening the purse strings, how in the world is that the decision that this front office made? That's where I would say a lot of Cardinals fans aren't going to trust this front office to be the front office that operates with a more of a shoestring budget and does it effectively because they have shown an unwillingness to spend money on the things that could breed upside, right? They, they sign older pitchers who you know what you're going to get. They're not going to bottom out on you, but also what's the upside? Like the Royals went out, look at them. They are crazy to think how quickly things can turn, but right now they're in the model franchise with what they're doing in the front office. They're making moves at the deadline for the players of need, and they're giving up things that, you know, they're they're turning less into more for their current roster as they make a playoff run. How'd they get here? Well, they signed guys in the offseason like Michael Walker and Seth Lugo that, a little bit younger, have a little bit more in the tank potentially to show you some upside. Like, they hit on their acquisitions. Well, they had to give Seth Lugo multiple years. The Cardinals got guys for only one year. Sure, but that, I mean, get what you pay for, right? Like, the, the guys that they were after were, were one-year guys. That was the caliber of free agent that they were. Cardinals could have spent a little bit more and gotten more upside, or they could have committed more years to different guys in, in that same kind of t salary tier. I mean, Seth Lugo's making maybe 15 mil a year over three years, and, and you know, Waka was shorter contract, but of that similar ilk. Um, look, the, they, they, they won't go to the, the puke point, if you will, of what it could take to actually gain some upside. And unfortunately, a lot of folks who looked at the signings of Lynn and Gibson and said, all right, I get what you're trying to do, but there's not a lot of upside here, ended up being proven correct with the way that the season's played out. Um, Gibson has sort of faltered down the stretch. Maybe he's running out of steam a little bit. Lynn has been fine, but, you know, he's been what kind of a lot of folks thought he would end up being. And that's gotten the Cardinals kind of right here stuck in the middle. They're not a terrible team. The Cardinals are 500 club. 69 wins, 69 losses. It's not as nice as you wanted it to be, but it's what it is. 
they're not terrible. They're not a losing team even at this point. But, you know, expectations in St. Louis are higher. It sounds like front office and ownership is basically saying adjust expectations. But the way that it could work in 2025, you know, here's how it could play out where they we kind of get the best of both worlds. The thing that they've been unwilling to do, give chances to younger players on, on smaller contracts, is maybe going to happen out of necessity. And maybe for the first time in a while when the Cardinals are, they don't have this, you don't perform as a young player, you're back to triple A or you're on the bench or you're to the bullpen. If they can't afford to have that mentality because they don't, they're not stocking their rotation with 35 year olds that, you know, are going to be given the veteran credence and the veteran, you know, they're going to be given the the benefit of the doubt where the young players aren't, they might have to see some young players gain some growth from it. They might have to grow from their struggles and maybe, down the, down the road, that ends up helping the organization because you allowed a guy to see through some struggles who wasn't a veteran, who wasn't a contract guy that was already getting paid so you felt like you had to. That could actually be an organizational philosophical shift that happens from this that could end up being very productive. right? Like What happens if McGreevy has to be in the rotation next year because they're just lowering the payroll and he's who they've got, but then you remember, oh, he's a former first-round pick. Oh, he's got some moxie to him. Oh, he's got... He's he's got a couple of good pitches that he's really worked on in the offseason and now he's effective. He can be a, a number five starter and you're gonna you're not gonna sink. You might swim. You know, you might actually get a four point two ERA out of him over thirty starts. And if you did, he's you're maybe not winning the World Series with that guy, but you you've got a you got a ball club that you can build upon. You can find out what you can do affordably within your rotation. I get it, Palante just had a bad game yesterday. He's had a lot of good games this year. You don't necessarily need to write off somebody from one bad game. They certainly don't write off Lance Lynn or Miles Michaelis from one bad game. What's the difference? They've got contracts. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean they're better. That doesn't necessarily mean they should be getting the benefit of the doubt relative to some of these other players. It's going to be an organizational shift that I think could actually be positive. And this is not not to take anything away from Lynn or Gibson as people or players or, or veterans or competitors or any of that. It's just if we're going to get down to the dollars and cents of it, 2025, you'd rather have Palante in your rotation than Lynn. You'd rather have Palante in your rotation than Gibson. You might rather have Michael McGreevy than both of those guys. If you're talking about needing to do more with less in terms of payroll, those are the types of decisions that a Cardinals team and an organization and a front office and an ownership group has not been willing to do in recent years because, in fairness, fans would have ripped it. Fans would have said, well, you can't, you're just, un, 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 you know, you're unwilling to spend. You're afraid to spend money. Maybe it's, Maybe by doing it that way, they will be able to spend more carefully on the things they actually need, which is not to say they didn't need starting pitching this last offseason. They just ne- probably needed a little bit more upside in the guys they went out and acquired. And and I think part of that is because the offense underperformed. If the offense had been a top-10 offense like it was billed to be, I think you could have gotten away with the pitching as it as it was designed and as it ended up playing out for the most part. But with the offense not carrying its load – You've just been, you know, you've you've been behind the eight ball the whole way through. Uh, by the way, Andre Palante, three point eight one is his ERA as a starter uh, this year in eighty seven innings. So, I'll I'll I will take that at the one point two million or whatever his salary ends up being next year. You can lock him in for thirty starts. He's never a guy that you should be trying to take out of the rotation or looking for any reason to put a Mats or a Lynn back in over him. This just should never be the case, especially not if you're going to shift to. Uh, we have to maybe be a little bit more attentive to payroll. Kind of, kind of view if you're the front office. Now, again, do you trust this front office to implement that payroll and still be competitive? The answer there can only be yes, if and only if Heim Bloom is elevated within the front office. He is given a high-ranking role, whether that means he's the pobo right away, whether that means he's he's almost on an equal footing with Mo as you do a transition year, whatever it is. I think Heim Bloom has to be central in the decision-making process, and I'm not saying he's brilliant. We really don't know, but we do know his track record of. Did more with less with Tampa. Was asked to do the same with Boston. Boston ran him out of town because they weren't happy with the results. But when you ask somebody to trade Mookie Betts away as your first big move because you're unwilling to pay him a, a, the contract he deserves, you probably are going to struggle and, and, and be fighting that uphill battle the whole way through. It's almost as though this Cardinal situation is tailor-made for what Boston asked Bloom to do. He did successfully, making an ALCS, winning around 500 the years that he didn't go deep in the playoffs, and did it with a lesser payroll than what Boston fans were used to. Like, Bill DeWitt is probably looking at that and going, yeah, that's what we need. We need more of that. How did you do that? Because we don't know what's going on with TV here. 
our fan base is getting a little bit tired of the the status quo, and so they may not be as supportive financially. We're going to need to have a better long-range plan than backfilling with expensive veterans every offseason and trade deadline because that hasn't been working. I think that's the shift you could see, but I do want people to be fairly warned, and it's comments like John Mozalak made on KMOX that I think are gearing you up for what that is going to potentially look like. But I also do think that there's a world in which they do that, and it goes not all too dissimilar to the product they put on the field this year. And if it's the foundational year to kind of build them back toward, okay, maybe another year down the road, They've won 81 games and they missed the playoffs in 2025. Or maybe some of the young players are better than everybody's given credit for and they rise up and they they do make the playoffs with a lesser payroll, with a less is more mentality. But then if you're able to do that and you start to kind of get that foundation back under you, then are there people in the front office now who we think are a little bit more equipped to go out there and sign the savvy free agent rather than just the guy who happens to live close to St. Louis? which has been seemingly the limitation of John Mozeliak's front office in St. Louis. We'll find out. Maybe that's all anybody's able to do because St. Louis isn't a desirable location anymore. Maybe that's part of it, and that's what Mozeliak's group would tell us, and we're going to find out, I think, because if another front office is able to maybe do more with less and sign the types of guys that they're making 10 to $15 million around the league, but they're at positions of need and they get the most out of their roster, then we'll maybe find out if, if that, you know, has been something that's been a real challenge or if it's something that's just a challenge for this particular front office and they haven't been able to to get guys to sign for whatever the reasons might be. So those are some of the things that I think could be coming down the pike. And uh, you know what? We'll end up we'll end up seeing. That's going to be the beauty of it is we're going to find out. But let me know, Cardinals fans, what are your thoughts on the recent comments from Mo and sort of the way that the wind seems to be blowing on this topic? Uh, we're not counting the Cardinals out. We haven't spent a lot of time talking about some of these recent games. Um, but because they're kind of right where they've always been. The Cubs have gone on a run, and the Cardinals are now third in the division, and the Cubs are four games above 500. Cardinals are right at 500. The, the Cubs are three and a half out of a wild card spot. The Cardinals are five and a half out. So uh, it's it's the Mets, it's the Braves, it's the Cubs right now, seemingly a three-team race in the NL, but the Cardinals would need to go on just a little bit of a run to get themselves back in that, and I know that the the white flag sort of seems to be what has been waving based on the moves and Sean Armstrong and Tommy Pham, but I think individually you can make a case that the roster didn't lose a ton from those moves. Maybe if Riley O'Brien is is just not viable that you're going to regret losing Armstrong, but those are sort of the moves that the Cardinals have made, and we'll see how much they really are able to gear toward what the rest of this season looks like and, and being able to remain competitive. They're not playing bad ball over this stretch. Remember, this started with that Dodgers series at Bush a couple of weeks ago, and they did drop two of three in that series despite, I thought, playing pretty good baseball and just not coming up with the timely hits to get two out of three in that series. But since then, they've either won or split every series. And now we're here at the beginning of September, which which is kind of that launching off point to say, all right, the schedule eases up a bit after this. You do get the Mariners over the weekend who um, are are kind of in that similar zone in the middle trying to fight. They're the exact same record as the Cardinals, but they've been skidding. They fired their manager. I mean, they're trying to save it, but it's not looking salvageable right now with the, the Astros opening up a pretty big lead over Seattle. Those are the games where, after that, it does lighten up in terms of playing fewer winning teams down the stretch. Cardinals have held their own, and they've played solid baseball during this stretch. Because of the hole that they had dug for themselves, it may not end up being enough without a serious, serious run that has to basically begin right now. We'll see what ends up happening the rest of the season. We'll continue talking about it all on B-Shape Daily. But let me know about those thoughts on John Mozeliak's comments If you guys had any here in the comments section below, thank you guys for supporting the channel, for signing up for channel memberships. That's still something you can do, even though we haven't talked as much about it in recent weeks. Um, I feel like memberships is going to be a valuable thing in the offseason because we'll be talking a lot about where the Cardinals go from here, and B-Shape Daily will be uh, still a pretty daily endeavor. I know it hasn't been this past week, but that's something that we're going to continue to roll with in the offseason as there should be so many rumors and reports and discussions to get into. So appreciate your guys' support. And remember, sign up for Underdog Fantasy with my promo code BSHAFE if you want to support the channel and a new channel partner in that way. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on BSHAFE Daily. Peace.